Who was Friedrich Nietzsche? Friedrich Nietzsche was born the 15th of October, 1844, in a little Prussian village named Röcken. According to Google Translate, that's how that's pronounced. His father, Karl Ludwig Nietzsche, was a mild-mannered rural Lutheran pastor who died of a mysterious brain illness when Nietzsche was only five years old. His younger infant brother Joseph soon followed after. This left the young Fritz, which was his nickname, and his younger sister Elizabeth to be raised by a mother, grandmother, and two spinster aunts. Even from a young age, Fritz suffered migraines and other health issues, and throughout his life he feared he would suffer the same fate as his father and brother. Now, the way that this little biographical sketch is going to be working is I will read a summary of my own research, and then I will read some interesting quotations from the primary and secondary literature. Uh, I'm using as my guide the biography by Ronald Heyman, A Critical Life of Nietzsche, though uh, in this case I'm mostly using it as just a handy place to have all of the quotations that I want because he does quote pretty extensively from letters and journals and stuff like that. So. so we have first here something written by Nietzsche himself some years after the fact. Quote, when I woke up that morning, the morning of his father's death, I heard weeping all round me. My dear mother came in tearfully wailing, O oh God, my dear Ludwig is dead. Young and innocent though I still was, I had some idea of what death meant, transfixed by the idea of being separated forever from my beloved father, I wept bitterly. The ensuing days were taken up with weeping and with preparations for the funeral. O oh God, I had become an orphan and my mother a widow. On 2nd of August, my dear father's earthly remains were consigned to the earth. The ceremony began at one o'clock, accompanied by the tolling of the bells. Oh, I shall always have the hollow clangor of those bells in my ears, and I will never forget the gloomy melody of the hymn, Jesus, my confidence, unquote. Later in the same account, Nietzsche tells of a dream that he had around this time. Remember, Nietzsche is only five. Quote, I heard the church organ playing as at a funeral. When I looked to see what was going on, a grave opened suddenly, and my father arose out of it in a shroud. He hurries into the church and comes back with a small child in his arms. The mound on the grave reopens, he climbs back in, and the gravestone sinks back over the opening. The swelling noise of the organ stops at once, and I wake up. In the morning, I tell the dream to my dear mother. Soon after that, little Joseph is suddenly taken ill. He goes into convulsions and dies within a few hours." Unquote. The next quotation is, uh, who is this from? I forgot to mention that uh, those journal entries were, when I said they were written sometime after the fact, I meant they were written when Nietzsche was 14. So there wasn't, there was still a number of years in between, but it wasn't something he wrote at the end of his life. Likewise, what I'm about to read here is something from one of his childhood friends, which was also written when he was about 14 when the friend was about 14, I mean. Quote, his, Nietzsche's, fundamental character trait, as a young man, he means, as a child, was a certain melancholy, which was apparent in his whole being. From earliest childhood onwards, he liked solitude and used to give himself up to his own thoughts. He had a very pious and profound mind, and as a child, he was already reflecting on many subjects to which most boys of his age pay no attention. As a small boy, he occupied himself with many kinds of games, which he had invented himself. 
So he took the lead in all our games, introducing new methods which made them more entertaining and more varied. He never did anything without consideration, and whatever he did had a definite and well-grounded purpose. Among his other principal characteristics were modesty and gratitude. His modesty often gave rise to a certain shyness, and he felt very ill at ease with strangers. In another of his writings from when he was 14, actually I think it's the same writing that uh, the dream and everything were taken from, Nietzsche wrote effectively a, an autobiographical sketch when he was only 14. Um, and I, I believe it concludes with this, but in any case this is one of the things he says in it, quote, In everything God has led me safely as a father leads his weak little child, I have firmly resolved to dedicate myself forever to his service, like a child, I trust in his grace. All he gives, I will accept joyfully. Happiness and unhappiness, poverty and riches, boldly confront even death, which will one day unite us all in eternal joy and bliss." Unquote. Ronald Heyman reports a episode from Nietzsche's youth when he was at school Quote, the sadomasochism concealed behind his severity with himself came to the surface when he became involved in an argument about Gaius Mucius Scaevola. Sorry for my pronunciation. The Roman soldier who, failing to kill Porsena, put his hand into a fire to prove his indifference to pain. Taking a handful of matches, Nietzsche set them alight and held them unflinchingly in the palm of his outstretched hand until a prefect knocked them to the ground. He was too late to save the hand from being badly burnt. Returning now to my own sketch, in school Nietzsche excelled at theology and languages. He ultimately sided with the latter, pursuing philology, i.e. classics, Greek and Roman literature and stuff like that, and leaving his Christian faith behind. His apostasy was gradual and took place between the ages of 18 and 21. It grew from doubts about the historical trustworthiness of the gospel narratives. These are epitomized in David Strauss's infamous Life of Jesus, which argued that Jesus' miracles were myths and folklore developed by Christian communities after the fact. Nietzsche partook of some of the usual antics of university students, and he received a small but permanent scar across his nose in a sword duel, according to, to Heyman. In 1865, February, when Nietzsche was 21 years old, we have the famous incident of the brothel which some of you might have heard about. I'm going to just go ahead and read Heyman's summary of it, which includes quotations from uh, a friend of Nietzsche's. Um, pardon me if I don't pronounce things correctly. That kind of goes for everything in this commentary. In February 1865, while he was visiting Cologne to see the sights, Nietzsche told a street porter to take him to a restaurant. Instead, the man led him to a brothel, as he afterwards told Dusen, his friend, quote, I found myself suddenly surrounded by half a dozen apparitions in tinsel and gauze, looking at me expectantly. For a short space of time I was speechless. Then I made instinctively for the piano as being the only soulful thing present. I struck a few chords which freed me from my paralysis, and I escaped, unquote. He had told Dusen at one point, according to Heyman, he was going to need at least three women, but his friend was left with the impression that Nietzsche remained a virgin throughout his life. That has, of course, been contested by many later writers and gossipers, frankly. There's, uh, it, Nietzsche has very often been associated with syphilis. It's been very often claimed as though it were a simple matter of fact that well, Nietzsche contracted syphilis, and they point to the brothel story and say, well, he probably went back or was lying or something, and he got syphilis there, and it slowly killed him and made him go crazy, and that's what happened. 
Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on this. All I'll say is that my own opinion is this is a very long and silly myth. And I'm going to quote from an article by a fellow named Leonard Sachs, who I think he's done the best, most definitive analysis of this situation. And there's been more articles since, but I'll post the Leonard Sachs article in the description. And I'll simply read his conclusion, but you can read the full article for yourself. Quote, when examined closely, every aspect of the syphilis hypothesis fails. In my view, there is no convincing evidence that Nietzsche ever had any form of syphilis. The time course of Nietzsche's illness is incompatible with even the most extraordinary presentation of syphilis. The details of Nietzsche's clinical presentation are inconsistent with syphilis. Other diagnoses are more plausible, unquote. And it is also worth reminding everyone that uh, Nietzsche's headaches and basic symptoms began when he was young, around the time that his father died, hence his fear that he was going to suffer the same fate as his father. In fact, I didn't really make it clear, but the symptoms that Nietzsche suffered seemed to bear some similarity with the symptoms that his father suffered before his father's death. Uh, so, as I mentioned, it was a mysterious brain illness, and that is what Nietzsche seems to have had. So it's much more likely it was something genetically inherited. Maybe Nietzsche did have syphilis on top of everything, but uh, I don't know. That just doesn't seem to make sense. I don't know enough about the medical history and uh, medicine in general, but um, there are plenty of good articles that you can look up that are trying to diagnose what Nietzsche actually had, and the Leonard Sachs article is a very good place to start. So that's all I'll say on that. The point is, is that after the brothel incident, actually several months after the brothel incident, so that happened in February apparently, and then interestingly, when he returned home for Easter, Nietzsche refused communion and church services to his mother and sister's horror. So this was the time when, as far as I'm concerned, Nietzsche, at least externally, broke with Christianity and his Christian faith and took a, took a stand against it. I will, in sort of connection with this, read a brief poem that Nietzsche wrote in 1864, which was a year before his break with Christianity. It is entitled, To the Unknown God. Quote, Once again, before I depart, before I look at the road so lonely, I raise my hands to you, the only refuge for my high-flying heart. Deep inside me is your altar, so however much I falter, and whatever may befall me, your voice will always call me." Unquote. Philosophically, Nietzsche's principal influence up to this point was Ralph Waldo Emerson. This was eclipsed when Nietzsche discovered Arthur Schopenhauer in October of 1865. So this is not long. This is the same year as his break with Christianity. He discovers Schopenhauer. Schopenhauer taught that the outside world is an illusion, which masks a more fundamental reality, which he called the will, which is discoverable through introspection. All things are ultimately expressions of and slaves to the will, which lures them on to eat, to drink, to sleep, to mate, to survive, to live, by offering them false promises of contentment. The only escape from this is through the meditative enjoyment of music, because this temporarily silences one's connection to the will. Schopenhauer, by the way, was influenced by both Buddhism and the Desert Fathers in Christianity. A few more quotes will be of use in connection with this. We have first here Nietzsche's account of getting a hold of his first copy of Schopenhauer's masterpiece, The World as Will and Representation. Quote, I took it in my hand as something totally unfamiliar and turned the pages. I do not know which demon was whispering to me, take this book home. In any case, it happened contrary to my principle of never buying a book too hastily. Back at the house, I threw myself into the corner of the sofa with my new treasure and began to let that dynamic, dismal genius work on my mind. Each line cried out with renunciation, negation, resignation. 
I was looking into a mirror that reflected the world, life, and my own mind with hideous magnificence." Unquote. Nietzsche would later break with Schopenhauer, uh, though it is interesting to see the effect that he had on him during this time. There's another quotation here. It's from a letter that Nietzsche sent home to his family during this time. Quote, Do you really take it so lightly, this existence in which so much is contradictory and nothing is clear except that it is not clear? It seems to me that you always evade the point by joking. There are two ways, my dears. Either we make efforts to live as narrowly as possible, accustoming ourselves to that screwing down the flame of spirit as low as it will go and seeking riches to live with the pleasures of the world. Alternatively, we know that life consists of suffering, that the harder we try to enjoy it, the more enslaved we are by it. And so we discard the goods of life and practice abstinence, being mean towards ourselves and compassionate towards everyone else, since we pity our comrades in misery." Unquote. His mother wrote back to him rather humorously uh, that she did not, quote, like that kind of display or that kind of opinion so much as a proper letter full of news, unquote. Um, finally, there's an incident that Heyman notes that I think is very representative of where Nietzsche was mentally at this point. Uh, quoting from Heyman, like the Romantics, Nietzsche was finding solace in the savagery of natural forces. One day, when a storm was threatening, he walked up a nearby hill, and at the top, just before the storm broke, found a man slaughtering two kids. Goats, it means child goats, in case you were wondering. Standing on the hilltop amid hail and thunder, Nietzsche could feel that personal anxieties were trivial and ethical imperatives absurd. Quote, how different lightning, storms, and hail are. Free forces, amoral. How happy and how powerful they are. Pure will, with no intellect to oppress them. Unquote. Returning again to my own account, Changes in military medical standards led to Nietzsche serving in the Prussian army. To his own surprise, he did very well as an equestrian artilleryman. He was a very good horseback rider. That is, until a riding injury incapacitated him. He returned to his studies, and his brilliance won him a professorship in philology at the unprecedented age of 24. He proved to be an effective lecturer and took his responsibility as an educator very seriously. Around this time, he became unlikely friends with legendary composer Richard Wagner and his wife, Kazima. Yes, that Richard Wagner. Richard Wagner. Everybody says Richard Wagner, but... Anyway, yes, it is that Wagner who wrote Ride of the Valkyries and the, the Ring Cycle and all of that. He, uh, not only was he good friends with him, but as we'll see, uh, he basically became a kind of son to Wagner. You see, Richard was born the same year as Nietzsche's late father, while Kazima, by the way, was only seven years older than Nietzsche himself. And before long, Nietzsche was effectively an honorary member of their household. They were, as far as I can tell, genuinely very fond of each other. I, I think it was a mutual relationship. A few more quotations here. One is an anecdote told by Heyman. This is about the, the horse riding injury. Uh, Nietzsche was pleasantly surprised to find he was the best horse rider among the 30 recruits. The officers praised his posture in the saddle and predicted he would reach the rank of captain. He had not expected either that he would have the potential for doing well in this role or that he would want to. But his progress towards a commission was humiliatingly interrupted. Myopia had made him a bad judge of distances. Myopia, he couldn't see very well. That's a, another matter we'll get into in a bit. Even at a short range and in the middle of March, jumping into the saddle, he threw himself so hard against the pommel that he tore two muscles in his chest. He felt a sharp, twitching pain in his left side, but rode on with Spartan determination. 
In the evening, the pain became so intense that he fainted twice. For ten days he lay in bed immobilized. He was in constant pain with a high temperature. Ice packs gave him little relief, and he would not have slept but for doses of morphine. You get the idea. The other quotation, or it's, it's another, it's a longer anecdote from Haman, but it concerns the transition of Nietzsche into being what I consider more of a member of the household, and it's interesting for showing the different sides of these people. Uh, but some context will be useful. So Richard had been previously married, Wagner, I'll just call him Wagner. Wagner had been previously married. He had had a number of children in that marriage, but then, well, he had an affair with Kazima, and then they ended up getting married instead. He, there was a divorce with the previous wife, I believe, and then he married Kazima eventually. And she was pregnant with his child. Um, so Kazima is much younger than Wagner. Um, so you have an interesting relationship there. Uh, seems like it was all quite benevolent, and Kazima outlived Wagner and sort of took over the estate. But in any case, uh, she was pregnant with one of his children, and around the same time, Nietzsche... They had made arrangements to um, spend time with Nietzsche the following day, and it was actually Kazima, apparently, who, even as the labor pains were coming on, was insisting that Wagner not change his plans for the next day and that he still make time for Nietzsche, that it would be okay. Uh, so anyway, it, it says here, um, at one o'clock in the morning, Kazima got out of bed to tell Wagner and to insist that Quote, there should be no change to arrangements for the day, that Nietzsche should stay for lunch with the children, unquote. The midwife arrived at three in the morning, and at four, Kazima bore her 56-year-old lover his first son. Quote, Richard felt an urge to demonstrate his joy throughout the house. He had handsome presents given to all the servants, unquote. He stayed with her all morning, leaving at noon to have lunch with Nietzsche and the children. He afterwards considered it a good omen that Siegfried, that was his, uh, his son, Siegfried's birth had coincided with his young friend's first overnight visit, while Nietzsche could not have been more impressed with his host. So there's an interesting symbolism going on there that Nietzsche's first overnight stay was the very night that Kazima gave birth to Richard's first son with Kazima. So it's, it's just an interesting... Uh, I don't know, it's, it shows at least where their psychology was, that he, Wagner noticed the connection there. Um, uh, for Nietzsche's part, the quotation here that's useful is he says, quote, Wagner fulfills every wish we could possibly have. The world knows nothing of the human greatness and singularity of his nature. I learn a great deal in his presence. This is my practical course in Schopenhauer's philosophy. The presence of Wagner is my consolation." Unquote. A later quotation from Nietzsche is, quote, We live there together, at Wagner's house, having the most stimulating fun in the most affectionate family circle and without any of the usual social trivialities. For me, it is truly a great stroke of luck. Unquote. Returning to my own narrative, Nietzsche was called to serve in the Franco-Prussian War as a medical orderly. Prussia was victorious, and as a consequence, the various German states were united under Prussia's leadership into the German Empire. Naturally, the question arose as to the cultural identity of unified Germany. Nietzsche's answer was effectively that they should adopt a new kind of Greek tragic art in his view, people could no longer believe in Christianity as they had done in the Middle Ages. Yet, without a suitable replacement for this worldview, modern man would sink into chaos and despair, i.e. nihilism. Nietzsche's alternative was the triumphant pessimism he saw in the ancient Greeks. There, the senseless suffering of life was not opiated with promises of heaven, but frankly embraced and transfigured through tragic art. For Nietzsche, the ancient Greek tragedies were actually closer to Catholic mass or something than mere entertainment, certainly not mere entertainment. It was a religious experience. 
They were originally celebrated, after all, in honor of the dying and resurrecting god Dionysus, whose agony and ecstasy were given different masks in different plays, the tragic heroes serving as his different avatars. Dionysus is he who glories in his continual death and resurrection. It's an affirmative form of Schopenhauer's will. Nietzsche saw Wagner as reviving this tragedy of tradition, this triumphant pessimism, via his notion of the opera as a kind of cultural festival. Through Wagner, Germany might yet achieve a glorious cultural future and rise to heights impossible under Christianity. This was more or less, it's my interpretation, but it's more or less the agenda behind Nietzsche's first published book called The Birth of Tragedy. Especially in the last 10 sections, it is really more a manifesto than an academic piece of scholarship. And though it very much pleased Wagner, it caused irreparable damage to the young professor's reputation. In the following years, Nietzsche became painfully disenchanted with Wagner, as though to add insult to injury. He began judging him more a demagogue than an avant-garde. Around this time, Wagner had commissioned the building of his own theater house in the town of Bayreuth, Germany, dedicated to showcasing his operas at an annual festival. Meanwhile, Nietzsche was working on a series of essays called Untimely Meditations. The fourth and final of these concerned Richard Wagner himself, and while hinting at Nietzsche's discontent, it was ultimately given over to idealistic hopes for the upcoming Bayreuth Festival. Nietzsche looked forward to seeing his dreams of cultural renewal realized through Wagner. He was sorely disappointed, however. Mostly he was disappointed by the atmosphere of Philistinism, populism, nationalism, and anti-Semitism. Nationalism and anti-Semitism, as a side note, went hand in hand in those days because Germany was celebrating her unification and the Jews were seen as unwilling or unable to assimilate. So they were seen as a threat to the new rising nationalism. Wagner, Nietzsche realized, was not really creating a cultural vanguard or trying to resurrect pre-Christian religion. He was merely entertaining wealthy flatterers and Philistines. In other words, he'd sold out. A useful quote to this effect uh, is from Nietzsche himself, quote, even to those most intimately concerned, the ideal was not what mattered most. Then there was the pathetic crowd of patrons at the Bayreuth Festival, all very spoilt, very bored, and unmusical as yowling cats. The whole idle riff-raff of Europe had been brought together and any prince who pleased could go in and out of Wagner's house as if it were a sporting event, and fundamentally, it was nothing more. In other words, what Nietzsche wanted, effectively, was for this to be a religious occasion. <laughs> and that's not what it was. It was a pop culture event. Um, and that's all that really Wagner seems to have truly intended for it, Nietzsche realized, and that greatly disappointed him. Uh, regarding the relationship of Nietzsche and Wagner, I think one of the best resources out there is a video by the channel Essential Salts. He has something called the Nietzsche Podcast, and actually, in general, major endorsement of that podcast. It's excellent. Um, yeah, definitely check that out. But I'll, I'll, a, good, a good place to start, I think, is just his account of the Nietzsche-Wagner relationship. Um, he is a better scholar of Nietzsche than I am, I would think, um, even if I am inclined not to agree on certain subtle points of interpretation of his philosophy. Certainly, for the historical context, definitely check him out. Well, check him out for everything. He's, he deserves the attention. Um, in any case, uh, that, is, that is what I'll say about that. Moving on with my narrative, two years later, after the Bayreuth Festival, in 1878, Nietzsche published his third major work, entitled Human, All Too Human. This was, in fact, the first work to feature his famous aphoristic style. This 
book solidified his break with Wagner by criticizing him, a good way to do it, along with German nationalism and anti-Semitism, along with all kinds of other things. It also praised several French thinkers whom Wagner detested on principle. Remember that Germany was unified after being at war with France. Wagner would later publish a polemic against Nietzsche, though not mentioning him by name. I have not read this polemic, by the way. I'm getting this information from Heyman, but I read that and was like, I'm going to include that. So uh, the break, the point here is that the break seems to have been mutually traumatic. I have a couple of quotations to this effect. Well, really more anecdotes. One of them is from Heyman, where he says, Gast... Peter Gast was a friend of Nietzsche's. We'll talk about him at the end of the end of this sketch, but suffice it to say that Peter Gast at one point played the third act of Twilight of the Gods as a piano duet. Nietzsche was frightfully upset at this. According to Gast, quote, he went quite pale and solemnly warned me that I must never again let him hear this mad, distorted music of Wagner's, unquote. Nietzsche went on seeming deeply hurt and for the whole of the following week he was feeling ill, which made Gast feel guilty. So that certainly indicates some trauma going on there. Um, there is a story on Wagner's end as well, actually, though I haven't been able to track it down for the purpose of this video. Um, but I'll relate it anyway in case one of you guys are luckier than I was, because I know I heard it someplace else. It's that some years after the break with Wagner, uh, somebody mentioned Nietzsche and was talking about Nietzsche while visiting Wagner. And upon hearing Nietzsche's name, Wagner had to step out of the room because he was so upset. And then when he had composed himself, he came back in and said, you will not utter that name in my presence again. I don't know if I'm exaggerating that, but that is how I recall the story being told. Again, if one of you can actually verify that, that'd uh, be handy for my little thesis that this was a mutual, mutually traumatic experience. I, I think it's incorrect to say that Nietzsche was hero-worshipping Wagner and Wagner had no feelings back towards Nietzsche. I certainly think that that is not true. Um, in any case, the following year, 1879, after the break with Wagner, Nietzsche's health declined drastically, and uh, so much, in fact, that he was forced to resign his professorship and to live on a pension. In particular, he suffered migraine headaches, terrible eyesight, punctuated, in fact, by moments of sudden blindness, and violent indigestion with frequent vomiting. His 36th birthday would be in 1880, and Nietzsche had every reason to think the end was near. This is because Nietzsche's father died at the age of 36. But death was tardy, and Nietzsche gradually recovered. He was blessed with one more decade in which to work. He spent it exchanging the climates and doctors of Switzerland, France, and Italy. But despite all the protests of his health, he continued to write. He reports, for example, well, this is according to Heyman, during the second half of February, he had two violent attacks with vomiting, one lasting for four days, the other for six. He lectured only once, this is before his departure from the university, and at the end of February, there was a night when he thought he was dying. He was glad to have completed the second part of Human All Too Human. Quote, Dear Heaven, Perhaps it is my last work, unquote. This is from a letter he wrote to Peter Gast. In December of that year, I believe, uh, Nietzsche had his worst Christmas yet, according to Heyman. After three days and nights of vomiting, he fell into a coma on the 27th. Before it, he had been longing for death, and afterwards he thought death was near, quote, if I cannot escape into better, warmer air, the worst will happen." Unquote. In one of his letters, he wrote, quote, My existence is a fearful burden. 
I would have thrown it off long ago if I had not been making the most instructive tests and experiments on mental and moral questions in precisely this condition of suffering and almost complete renunciation. On the whole, I am happier than ever before, and yet continual pain. For many hours of the day, a feeling closely akin to seasickness, a semi-paralysis which makes it difficult to speak, alternating with furious attacks. My consolation is my thoughts and perspectives. I write nothing at a desk, but on my way here and there, I scribble on a scrap of paper. Returning to my narrative, his brush with death marked a turning point in his philosophy, at least in my opinion. Strange to say, he became increasingly optimistic in his tone. In 1881, a year after the fateful year of 1880, he published Daybreak, though like all his books it did not sell very well. Later in 1881, he decided to try the atmosphere of Sils Maria in Switzerland. There he discovered and fell in love with the work of Baruch Spinoza. Then in August, as if to compensate for his sufferings, Nietzsche appears to have had a breakthrough its intensity bordering on a religious experience. This breakthrough was the thought of eternal recurrence. In the middle of the month, he wrote, quote, On my horizon, thoughts have arisen the like of which I have never seen before. Sometimes I think the life I am living is really dangerous because I am one of those machines that could explode, unquote. Several times he had found his eyes were so inflamed that he could not leave his room. Quote, Each time I had wept too much the previous day while I was walking, and not tears of sentimentality, but jubilation. I sang and talked nonsense, possessed by a new attitude. I am the first man to arrive at it. Unquote. Heyman says that in none of these letters to Gast and his sister Elizabeth did he describe the new attitude, but the first notes relevant to Thus Spake Zarathustra contain the jotting, quote, Beginning of August 1881 in Sils Maria, 6,000 feet above the sea and much higher above all human things. Exactly what happened, he never tells us but he appears to have asked himself how he would react if given the chance of repeating the whole of his life exactly as it had been. He was 37 years old at this time. I'm actually going to go ahead and read the section from The Gay Science, one of his later books, where he gives the thought of eternal recurrence. This is section 341 of The Gay Science. Quote, the greatest weight. What if some day or night a demon were to steal after you into your loneliest loneliness and say to you, this life as you now live it and have lived it, you will have to live once more and innumerable times more and there will be nothing new in it but every pain and every joy and every thought and sigh and everything unutterably small or great in your life will have to return to you, all in the same succession and sequence. Even this spider and this moonlight between the trees and even this moment and I myself, the eternal hourglass of existence is turned upside down again and again, and you with it, speck of dust. Would you not throw yourself down and gnash your teeth and curse the demon who spoke thus? Or have you once experienced a tremendous moment when you would have answered him, you are a god, and never have I heard anything more divine. If this thought gained possession of you, it would change you as you are, or perhaps crush you. The question in each and every thing, do you desire this once more and innumerable times more, would lie upon your actions 
as the greatest weight? Or how well disposed would you have to become to yourself and to life to crave nothing more fervently than this ultimate eternal confirmation and seal? Unquote. Returning to the narrative, in early 1882, Nietzsche's French friend Paul Ri introduced him to a beautiful and precocious Russian lady, Lou Salome. She was 21 years old, while Nietzsche was about 37 to 38. From the first, they were struck by their intellectual compatibility and could talk for long hours at a time about philosophy and religion. She welcomed Nietzsche as a philosophical mentor or tutor. On one occasion, they hiked up the Sacred Mount in Orta, Italy. At the top, overlooking the lake, Nietzsche revealed to her his thought of eternal recurrence, as well as the character of Zarathustra. She may have been the first person that Nietzsche told. Later that year, Nietzsche would publish The Gay Science, which ends with the first mention of either Zarathustra or the eternal recurrence in all of Nietzsche's works, to my knowledge anyway. It was reported that Nietzsche seemed much healthier during this time. Heyman has a nice collection of quotes from the various letters that were being sent back and forth in this time. He says, their talks were most profitable. That's a quotation from Nietzsche. Nietzsche rated her as, quote, the most intelligent of all women. Religion, he said later, was really our only topic. One day, Lou wrote to Re, Nietzsche will reveal himself to be the prophet of a new religion, a religion that will recruit initiates from among heroes, unquote. Nietzsche and Lou were spending 10 hours a day in conversation, she reported, and we are led involuntarily by our conversation to the abyss, to those giddying spots where you have the impression of having climbed in solitude for a vantage point to view the depths. That's a quote from Lou. Nietzsche also quoted, In mentality and taste, he wrote, There is a deep affinity between us, together with so many dissonances that each of us is most instructive to the other. I wonder whether such philosophical openness as there is between us has ever existed before. The historian Rudolf Binion wrote a book called Frau Lu, Nietzsche's Wayward Disciple, which is probably one of the best historical overviews of the relationship of Nietzsche and Lu. It's not just about that. That's just the first part of it. Um, the rest is just about Lu herself. But in, speaking as a non-expert, it seems to be the best uh, book out there. Having said that, I do not own the book. Um, my review of the book, I'm likely not to ever own the book because it's like 70 bucks <laughs> on Amazon. I have been going off of the excerpts that I've been able to get from Google Books and stuff like that. And also, he is quoted in a number of places by both Kaufman and by Heyman in his biography. So that's why I have the impression that I do. But in any case, quoting from, from his book, he, he quotes extensively from their letters. And uh, I'm just going to make an extensive quotation here. Lou wrote, for example, about spending time with Nietzsche on August 14th in, quote, the quiet dark pine forest alone with the sunshine and squirrels, adding, quote, conversing with Nietzsche is uncommonly lovely, but there is a quite special charm in the meeting of like thoughts and like emotions. We can almost communicate with half words, only because we are so kindred could he take the difference between us, or what seemed to him such, so violently and painfully? The content of a conversation of ours really consists in what is not quite spoken, but emerges of its own from our tacit exchanges. He gave me his hand and said earnestly and with feeling, never forget that it would be a calamity if you did not carve a memorial to your full innermost mind and the time left to you. But is it good for him to spend the whole day from morning to night in conversation with me, hence away from his work? When I asked him this today, he nodded and replied, 
but I do it so seldom and am enjoying it like a child. The same evening, though, he said, I ought not to live long in your vicinity. We often recollect our time together in Italy, and he said softly, Sacred Mount, I have you to thank for the most bewitching dream of my life. That all being said, the idea that Nietzsche was frothing at the mouth after Lou Salome and desperately proposed marriage to her multiple times is simply a myth. Hopefully some of these quotes have helped to demonstrate that certainly their relationship was mutual. It is also rather complicated. Nietzsche's own letters indicate that he saw Salome first and foremost as a protege and a kindred spirit. Any romantic feelings were by Nietzsche considered in incidental to this and followed after that. If anything, it was Salome who was more obviously romantically conflicted over Nietzsche, not vice versa. I'm not a scholar, but that's just my impression from what I have at least read. She did genuinely love him as a teacher, uh, but in any case, her later accounts of Nietzsche are in many instances unsupported by the documents from the time, by which I mean she is the principal source for the story of the marriage proposals of this idea of Nietzsche proposing multiple times to Lou Salome and it always being very awkward and yeah, the, that comes from Blue, and that's not supported by the documents at the time. I think before I spend any more time on this, um, there's a very good article. You have both Rudolf Binion, who I'll read his assessment in a moment, but there's also a very good article. It's not a scholarly article, but it, it's quoting a great deal from the primary literature. Um, so I'll, I'll post that in the description below. Um, it does a good job of at least summoning up the counter evidence to the marriage proposal stories. And it, in fact, it's that page which quotes from Binion to say, quote, no evidence beyond Lou's say-so will ever turn up that Nietzsche proposed to her. We also have some words from Walter Kaufman, quote, after Rhee's death, Lou spread the tale that both he and Nietzsche had proposed marriage to her and that Nietzsche had asked Rhee to transmit his proposal. Others embellished the story by adding that, unknown to Nietzsche, she was Rhee's mistress even then. Rudolf Binion has shown that she remained a virgin until more than ten years later and that Nietzsche never proposed marriage to her, although she was apparently waiting for him to do so." Unquote. To return to the narrative, the trio, this would be Nietzsche, Lou, and Rhee, hoped to establish a kind of philosophical platonic commune, almost like a monastery, really, where they would cultivate a new avant-garde of free spirits to rejuvenate European culture. And they really did intend their relationship to remain platonic, as silly as that might sound to modern folks. But that was their plan. This, I believe, was originally Lou's idea. In any case, it was easier said than done. To greatly oversimplify the matter, Paul Rhee, perhaps jealous of Nietzsche and Salome's intellectual intimacy, began sowing doubts in her mind as to Nietzsche's true intentions for her, claiming that Nietzsche was a lunatic who only wanted to sleep with her. Meanwhile, Nietzsche's conservative sister Elizabeth took umbrage with the liberal Lou and sought to sabotage the relationship. All of this led to a falling out between Nietzsche and his own family, and then finally with both Lou and Re, who both abandoned him in the November of 1882. Obviously, that's a very quick and dirty explanation of what was a very complex falling out between them, but that's all I have to say about it for now. We'll probably get more into it as I go into the commentary of Zarathustra, but... Crushed and alone, Nietzsche traveled to Rapallo, Italy, in a sudden storm of artistic inspiration with many marks of mystic revelation. He produced, in only ten days, the first book of his magnum opus, Thus Spake Zarathustra. It was serendipitously published the same day that Wagner died. Nietzsche produced three more books, or parts, to his master work, between 1882 and 1885, 
This was the beginning of the end. In 1886, he published Beyond Good and Evil at his own expense, followed in 1887 by On the Genealogy of Morals. In 1888, he finished five more books. Twilight of the Idols, The Antichrist, The Case of Wagner, Ecce Homo, and Dionysian Dithyrams. It is impossible to summarize the prodigious depth and breadth of any of these works. Regarding what I rather quickly went over as all the marks of mystic revelation, I'm going to quote from Nietzsche's own words in Ecce Homo when he talks about, Ecce Homo, by the way, was effectively his autobiography, and he's talking about the period in which he wrote Thus Spake Zarathustra. Quote, has anyone at the end of the 19th century a clear idea of what poets of strong ages have called inspiration? If not, I will describe it. If one had the slightest residue of superstition left in one's system, one could hardly reject altogether the idea that one is merely incarnation, merely mouthpiece, merely a medium of overpowering forces. The concept of revelation, in the sense that suddenly, with indescribable certainty and subtlety, something becomes visible, audible, something that shakes one to the last depths and throws one down, that merely describes the facts. One hears, one does not seek, one accepts, one does not ask who gives. Like lightning, a thought flashes up with necessity without hesitation regarding its form. I never had any choice. A rapture whose tremendous tension occasionally discharges itself in a flood of tears. Now the pace quickens involuntarily. Now it becomes slow. One is altogether beside oneself with the distinct consciousness of subtle shudders and of one's skin creeping down to one's toes, a depth of happiness in which even what is most painful and gloomy does not seem something opposite, but rather conditioned, provoked, a necessary color in such a superabundance of light, an instinct for rhythmic relationships that arches over wide spaces of forms, length, the need for a rhythm with wide arches is almost the measure of the force of inspiration, a kind of compensation for its pressure and tension. Everything happens involuntarily in the highest degree, but as in a gale of a feeling of freedom, of absoluteness, of power, of divinity. The involuntariness of image and metaphor is strangest of all. One no longer has any notion of what is an image or a metaphor. Everything offers itself as the nearest, most obvious, simplest expression. It actually seems, to allude to something Zarathustra says, as if the things themselves approached and offered themselves as metaphors. This is my experience of inspiration. I do not doubt that one has to go back thousands of years in order to find anyone who could say to me, it is mine as well, unquote. One can, of course, uh, critique this position. Kaufman himself critiques it, saying that there are many people, certainly shorter than thousands of years ago, but that's beyond, besides the point. That is Nietzsche's very strange description of the conditions he was under when he wrote and conceived of and figured out, thus spake Zarathustra. On the 3rd of January, 1889, at the age of 44, Nietzsche suffered a mental breakdown, the first in a wave of a coming storm of dementia. He began to write manic memos to his current and former friends, signing them alternatively Dionysus or The Crucified, and incoherently referencing his superhuman authority and power. His friends and family sought treatment for him, but to no avail. Just then, his works began to gain popularity and recognition. His sister, the same one who sabotaged his relationship with Lou, had just returned 
from her failed attempt at a proto-Nazi commune in Paraguay. It's a very long story. <laughs> uh, I'll try to summarize it here. His sister married a staunch anti-Semite named uh, Forster, and uh, together they went to Paraguay. And uh, I say proto-Nazi. Um, I don't know that much about it, but that's how it's usually described. I mean, it, it was anti-Semitic to its core. Anyway, it was a weird project, and it failed. I believe that her husband, Forster, committed suicide, actually, and it was after that that she returned to Germany. Um, but in any case, she returns around this time, presumably because she hears about the breakdown, and she took over his estate uh, and capitalized on his newfound success by tailoring, through censorship and even through forgery, Nietzsche's writings in order to appeal to an anti-Semitic nationalist audience. After the death of their mother, Elizabeth set her brother up as a tourist attraction effectively for wealthy visitors, and for ten more years he withered away in dementia and paralysis before dying of a stroke at noon on the 25th of August, 1900. Three friends remained with him to the bitter end and therefore deserve explicit mention. Heinrich Koselitz was a former student who became Nietzsche's secretary and transcriptionist. Nietzsche gave him the nickname and pseudonym Peter Gast. So when I was mentioning Peter Gast, that's who that is. There was also Franz Overbeck along with his wife, Ida Overbeck. Franz was Nietzsche's colleague at Basel and continued a fast friend and correspondent long after uh, Nietzsche had left there. Franz was a Protestant theologian who argued that the Catholic Church Fathers had betrayed Christ's original message by trying to rationalize it and make it into a theology. Finally, Malvida von Meisenburg, I think that's how that's pronounced, met Nietzsche through Wagner and remained a matronly figure for him even after the break with Wagner. If Nietzsche is to be properly understood, it should not be forgotten that among his most loyal friends were a Christian theologian and an independent older woman.